Hi there. This is Manning from the Weird Sisters podcast. You may notice some slight audio issues with this next episode. I apologize. I was trapped in a time vortex. Everything should be back to normal next time. Thank you so much for your patience and have a great day. Especially you. Welcome to the Weird Sisters Podcast, your source for Discworld discussion. My name is Manning, and I'm a history monk. Joining me is Danny, the mystery monk. True enlightenment can only be found by following the trail of clues it left behind. And Liz, the chemistry monk. Reincarnation is actually just the soul precipitating. Our book this month is Thief of Time, a story whose title my brain insists should start with the. <laughs> Fair. Ah! Ah! <laughs> I was expecting more of a uh, someone who steals time. More of a heist story, perhaps? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, the the villain has been taking time away from people and places, and that's causing an uproar that somebody needs to go stop, perhaps? I, I should have realized that the title is often misleading. And rather than being someone a thief stealing time, it is a thief belonging to time in a sense. And I'm just, I love that play on words very, very dearly. <laughs> so I had to get the, I had to hunt down the mass market paperback, I think is the copy I got. And it's got somebody who looks like Paul Revere on the front cover. So I was definitely expecting somebody to have like actually stolen time. And then I was halfway through the book, I was like, wait a second, that's not what this book about is about at all. No. <laughs> and of course, none of us are working from the original cover art, which I want to discuss a little bit after the trivia section. Awesome, sure. Yeah. Speaking of... Published April 24th, 2001, and coming in at just under 103,000 words, Thief of Time is the 26th Discworld book and 5th in the Death series. Its title comes from the expression, Procrastination is the Thief of Time, which is a line attributed to the poet Edward Young in his work The Complaint, or Night Thoughts on Life, Death, and Immortality, published in nine parts from 1742 to 1745. The name Miria Lejeune is inspired by the character of Legion from the Bible, where Jeremy Clarkson's name is most likely inspired by the English broadcaster Jeremy Clarkson. The book is heavy with references to previous Discworld stories, as well as The Matrix, Karate Kid, Bride of Frankenstein, and Reservoir Dogs, plus one supporting character that is a direct reference to the James Bond series. Another minor character is named after Marco Soto, writer for LR Games, as his prize for winning a charity auction to Scotty's House Child Advocacy Center. Thief of Time has been translated into over a dozen languages across almost 75 editions, including three different audiobooks, an 11-hour version with Stephen Briggs, a 4-hour abridged version with Tony Robinson, and a 12-hour multi-voice production narrated by Stefan Ronicki, and a small cast, notably including a guest appearance by Harlan Ellison. The story was adapted for the stage in 2014 by Pamela Munt for the Unseen Theatre Company in Adelaide, Australia in addition to Tim Foster's adaptation of the story for Ook Productions. The book was one of the two Discworld novels nominated for the 2002 Locus Award and placed 152nd on the 2004 Big Read Survey. This is also the last book to get cover art by Josh Kirby, who passed away the same year that this story was published. We haven't talked much about Kirby's work because this is an audio medium and none of us are reading from the first editions, but I'd like to take a minute to just reflect on his art a little bit. I don't know if either of you two have, have taken a moment to look at some of Josh Kirby's covers, but he has a very interesting style. It's like very evocative of like Boris Vallejo paintings. Yeah, I check out a lot of the Discworld books from my local library, uh, the bulk of which have were donated by somebody um, and a lot of them were the first editions and it's like it's a very unique art style that feels very appropriate to 
books published from like the 80s and 90s. Or to borrow a descriptor from a different Discord podcast, they have kind of a lumpy art style. Yeah, <laughs> that's incredibly true. That's honestly the only way I could think to describe it is lumpy. <laughs> they usually depict highly specific scenes at a time or a broad scope of them all at once. Yeah. Which can come off at times as being highly inaccurate. I believe there's a quote by Terry Pratchett himself mentioning that the old women characters in the stories tend to become young women wearing not much clothing on the covers. Fair. I think a lot of the time I have a tendency to like normalize the fantasy setting, so everything becomes a lot more looking like a Hollywood production. But the Josh Kirby covers are very, very fantastical, and it very much like every time I see them, it very much puts me back in that place where it's like, oh yeah, this is like real fantasy. For some reason, Susan is wearing a white robe when it looks like she is supposed to be in the classroom with a bunch of children like death's robe but white and yes she is holding a scythe well we're however long in and we haven't even actually started talking about the book so let's get into it broadly speaking the first thing that happens in the story is really that history exploded <laughs> the story begins with enlightenment as we meet the first man to truly understand time where who what oh when the eternally surprised why? How could you say that? <laughs> so along with his apprentice, Claude Poole, Wen resolves to found a monastery dedicated to shaping, bending, and witnessing the flow of time through the Discworld. From there, we move to the domain of death. He is in his office. And, through the use of a device that tests slices of toast for if they land butter side down, he determines that the auditors are approaching. For those keeping score at home, the auditors are a rare instance of a recurring villain for Discworld. They're a collective of millions of grey metaphysical beings that want broadly to snuff out intelligent life. To be fair though, who wouldn't see themselves become the villain? when all they want is to be able to finish doing the filing. <laughs> While trying to figure out the auditor's plan, Death also observes the witch, Githa Og. He sees three instances where a man comes knocking at her door in need of a midwife. Once when she is just starting out as a witch, then a few decades later when she's getting into her stride, and finally when she is the Nanny Og we know from the witch books. The two of them vanish, and the nanny returns alone. Death comes to the conclusion that he has two things to do. His first job is to get someone to stop the auditors, and that means he needs his granddaughter, Susan Stowe Hewlett. Susan! Woo! <laughs> we last saw Susan in Hogfather, where she was employed as a governess. Now she's graduated from Goth Mary Poppins to Goth Miss Frizzle. <laughs> We see her explaining time zones to her students when she gets a letter from her grandfather, courtesy his little sidekick, the Death of Rats. Oh man, this this Susan is one of the only Susans who I respect. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't. There's a lot of Susans I haven't met. This Susan in particular, though, like it, this seems like kind of where she was always meant to be. Like she seems very, very naturally doing being a teacher. So naturally that it unnerves her uh, co-workers in quite a comedic fashion. How dare you teach a seven-year-old how to do algebra? So Susan is in Ankh-Morpork, Pork, and elsewhere in the city we meet Jeremy, the prodigy clockmaker, in the middle of his work. Jeremy is also internally bemoaning his lack of a social life. An orphan, he was raised by the Clockmakers Guild where he discovered a natural affinity for timekeeping that has blossomed into obsession and a complete lack of social skill. He has only two regular visitors, uh, the milkman, Ronnie Soak, and Dr. Hopkins, the guild secretary, who stops by to deliver Jeremy his special medicine. The way that the narrative treats Jeremy's neurodivergence is unflattering. Yeah, it feels like... Very old school and very tired. 
Yeah, the the point I wanted to bring up about that, I'm I'm glad we all kind of collectively caught the neurodivergent part because especially with this being a book about time, that's extremely relatable. I met Jeremy and I'm like, "Wow, he's he's pretty boring, but dang if I don't get where he's coming from." Mhm. Mm one of the uh one of the hallmarks of ADHD in my experience is uh having a complete lack of concept of time. Things are either going way too fast or way too slow. Yeah, we don't get to like necessarily spend a whole lot of time with Jeremy, and so it makes his neurodivergence feel very one note and shallow. When you know, th there's a lot of room to explore how his how his relationship with time obviously exists because you know he has strong opinions about time. Like it would have been great to actually know why he feels those things or what he even feels specifically about it. Jeremy receives a commission from a strange yet very pretty woman who introduces herself as Lady Miria Lejean. She wants Jeremy to build a very special device, a glass clock, one that can tell time more perfectly than any other device yet crafted. Far from Ankh-Morpork, high in the Ramtop Mountains, we see the Valley of the History Monks, the order founded by Wen the Eternally Surprised. There we meet Lobsang Lud, a novice who was brought to the order after displaying incredible innate talent for manipulating time. Originally from Ankh-Morpork, where he was raised by the Thieves Guild, Lobsang has minor kleptomania, which proves his failing when he steals a miniature gardening trowel from one of the sweepers, Lu Tsi. You two remember Small Gods? Yeah. Mm. You remember the sweeper from that one? Oh, yeah. It's this sweeper. Yes. <laughs> in fact, actually, they specifically call out that he mucked about a bit in Omnia and messed up <laughs> the timeline, gently averting several hundred years of war. Uh, you know, I think we can forgive that one. So here, Lutzi is also integrated with a throwaway joke from Witches Abroad, The Way of Mrs. Cosmopolite, which is about playing on the idea of Westerners traveling to Asia to find enlightenment by basically asking, well, what if they did that to us? <laughs> I had thought that that was also a odd reference to Cosmopolitan magazine. Yeah. Which I've never read, so I can't entirely be sure. Uh, maybe. All of his, his sayings of the way are basically, like, folk sayings, so... I think Cosmopolitan and Cosmopolite obviously kind of have, like, the same root word. So I don't know if it's necessarily a reference to the Cosmopolitan magazine. Um, but I think it's referencing the same kind of, like, vibe, if that makes any sense. What cosmopolite actually means as a word, I'm not entirely sure. So uh, It means citizen of the universe, basically. Okay. Uh, as opposed to metropolitan, a citizen of some uh, locale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, also to add on to that, the Merriam-Webster website says it also means having wide international sophistication, like worldly. M much like Lutz C. Yeah. There's also a line that refers to his way as subsidential rubbish, as opposed to transcendental, <laughs> which, which is good, although I wonder about the prospect of cis-sendential. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would be intriguing. So, Lu Tsi and Lobsang have been instructed to visit the abbot of the monastery. Along the way, Lu Tsi gets accosted by a medium-rank monk, only for that monk to soil his gi upon realizing who he's talking to. Which is where Lu Tsi introduces Lobsang to Rule 1 of the History Monks. Do not act incautiously when confronting a little, bald, wrinkly, smiling man. Which I think could probably be, like condensed down a bit but you know i'm not a monk <laughs> yeah i mean it's a bit wordy but i think it's solid advice it turns out that the senior monks want Lutzi to take on lobsang as an apprentice and he reluctantly agrees both of them show some frustrations lobsang knows Lutzi's reputation as a great hero of the monks but finds it hard to reconcile the stories with this silly old man who refuses to fight and Lu Tsi, for all his virtues, is annoyed with how regimented the monastery has become. The stagnation of a place where there are constant cherry blossoms and no cherries. I 
like the concept of the character the, of the abbot. Good place to talk about him. The abbot of the history monks. Most of the history monks are able to live supernaturally long lives through a process referred to as circular aging, as opposed to circular breathing. Uh, the abbot doesn't seem to have a handle on that, so he just reincarnates, which leads to a lot of him being a baby in this story <laughs> specifically. Did we get a reference to the abbot in like one of the very early Discworld books? Yeah, from Mort. Okay, I was like, I feel like this is familiar, but I also don't know if my brain's just making up stuff at this point. <laughs> And likely in itself a reference to the Dalai Lama. Uh, just the the specifics of um, the abbot reincarnating as himself over and over again, and despite age being known as like their leader, sort of. So that's uh, why the Dalai Lama comes to mind because it's a similar it's a similar situation in that regard. Although I do have to wonder. The footnote about the abbot's reincarnation getting uncomfortable when he's in his infancy slash toddler stage. I wonder if all that awkwardness could be avoided if they instead gave him a bottle. Back in Ankh-Morpork, we see that Jeremy has started designing the glass clock to Lady Miria's approval. She has also hired an Igor to be his assistant. This Igor tells Jeremy that his grandfather, Igor, worked for the man who built the original glass clock, mentioning a very strange explosion, and in the end, that the clock never existed. Leave it to an Igor to break history like that. I mean more along the lines of breaking the patch on history in, in remembering this thing that never existed. I don't know. I guess it's, I I mean, in general, I really, really like Igor as a character, like the the collective Igor. Um, but in this book, uh, I don't know, he feels a little super, superfluous in the end. Like, I almost can't wonder if the things he does could have been given to, like, uh, to Miria. Maybe, but also just like, his purpose in the narrative is largely to give us a perspective on jeremy like an outsider's perspective on jeremy mm -hmm. okay yeah and that's kind of useful but also kind of takes away the opportunity for us to understand jeremy more closely yeah and, and that's why i feel like he, despite all the time we spend with jeremy we don't get to hear a lot of what he's actually thinking about anything other than he has this compulsion to actually build this clock elsewhere in the city Susan finds her grandfather in a traditional English gentleman's club, where he explains the auditor's plan to stop the flow of time. Death also mentions that time is, like himself, an anthropomorphic personification, and that she has a half-human son. Susan is annoyed about being dragged into another supernatural adventure, but she's the only one who can do anything about it, so she heads out to investigate. I also like the fact that she immediately catches on and fixates on there being another part human, non-human, and even goes so far as to blame Death for dropping that tidbit in order to get her more invested in the adventure. <laughs> I can assume that being like a partially human human being is probably a little isolating when you can do things that other people can't and can't really even understand especially like since she's more comfortable with her abilities and such and is able to use them freely as goth mary poppins or as goth miss frizzle which is beyond an accurate comparison <laughs> that you know we we see in her narrative and in, in her thoughts, she there's a heavy repetition of someone like me. Oh my, like, oh my gosh, there's another person like me out there. And then she goes back and recalls how difficult it was for her at 16 to come to terms with this fact. So she's like, Welp, I ain't resigning. I'm not resigning somebody else to that fate. So mm -hmm. here we go. Back with the history monks, Lucy is training Lobsang when they feel a disturbance in the flow of causality. The sweeper 
brings his apprentice below the monastery, where they keep the procrastinators, uh, large devices that wind and unwind the time stream. This, it is revealed, is the actual purpose and duty of the history monks. Time in the Discworld universe is fragile and often gets disrupted, so the monks use the procrastinators to correct it when things go wrong. The narration doesn't dive too deep into the technicals of how the procrastinators and the time stream actually work. It probably is for the best, but anyway, the only real point is that Lobsang instantly figures them out and is able to flawlessly correct the time slip. If it wasn't already obvious that there's something special about this kid, yeah, <laughs> now is then. Yeah, the procrastinators are a lovely little bit of like fantasy sci-fi world building that is just like adds a lot of, of flavor and it goes ooh i i pictured them as functioning somewhat like mechanically wind taking thread from a spool and winding it onto a bobbin for people who know the sewing terms which is immensely satisfying when it goes well but i also wanted to mention that at this point where Lobsang just looks at it and understands everything just clicks and he gets how the board works and how these massive this massive floor of various devices goes was also a uh, a, a, a neurodivergency oh i get that kind of thing he he seemed to slip into flow in order to get things done it's an immensely satisfying feeling when it does happen it's just like oh i get that it is the long standing opinion of this podcast that there are no neurotypical people in discworld <laughs> yeah, and I think in this case it's a very good metaphor uh, for that kind of thing because I think it's this moment in the book where uh, Lutze, Lutze asks uh, Lop saying how he was able to figure it out and he makes a reference to like he just had the time to figure it out. Once the procrastinators are balanced, Lutze and Lobsang visit the abbot and discuss the impending disaster. They're aware that someone is rebuilding the glass clock. It's revealed that Lutzi had tried to stop the first one from being completed, but he was too late, and that failure still haunts him. It took the monks 500 years of their personal time to piece history back together, and they made mistakes along the way, which is why there are continuity errors in the Discworld books. I think that's a really good like textual reason to explain a, a very IRL thing. <laughs> Necessary? Maybe no, but since this is more uh, soft world building than hard strict world building in this series, like what happens happens, dang if I don't appreciate that there's an entire book that contextualizes it. <laughs> yeah, I think that's kind of how I feel. Like I'm in general not somebody who gets too bogged down by errors like that because I recognize that, you know, all these stories are being created by human people and human people are very fallible. So I, in general, I can hand wave that stuff away pretty easily. But when, you know, there is an in-world explanation for that, it does, I don't know, it's a nice little detail. Not necessary, but fun. Through a little bit of subterfuge, Lutzi gets the abbot's permission to go to Ankh-Morpork, where he suspects that the clock is being built. Along the way, he and Lobsang stop in on the head engineer for the monks, whose name is probably pronounced more along the lines of Chu, but this is Q from James Bond. <laughs> there, they acquire a pair of portable procrastinators so that they have an emergency reserve of time. Jeremy and Igor continue to work on the clock, their progress regularly checked by Lady Lejean. We soon learn that she is actually an auditor, having taken on a human form to make it easier to persuade mortals to do dirty work. Okay, now I think is a good time for me to say I love her. Mm -hmm. I love her very much. I actually made a couple notes in my copy of the book. Yeah, one of them was just like, she's an auditor who has to follow the rules, but she lies. And that was the moment where I'm like, oh, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I like her. And then that was page 160, and then fast forward to page 271, and my note is just, I love her. <laughs> <laughs> Important notes. <laughs> she is a really interesting character because you have this idea of these beings who have no real concept of self, 
and then you force one of them to have a self. And that's obviously like a lot of things to kind of process there. And I, and I appreciate that she doesn't necessarily handle it perfectly. I'll just, I'll just say again, neurodivergency speaking here, the way a lot of these things are described, like the dark behind the eyes or that little voice inside, like it makes so much sense. In, in fact, a lot of this book to me, how time is described, the flow, the movements, and uh, selves separated from others, selves coming together, that those are concepts that really intrigue me. And so I fell in hard with this book once I realized those were the concepts being explored. And it's just, wow, yeah, I can really relate to that. What is it to be human? Because there's always that isolating sort of othering feeling you get when you function differently from what you perceive to be everyone else. It's just like, yeah, no, I, I don't quite understand what it is you're saying. You need to actually explain that metaphor to me. I literally don't think the way you do. It's, it was, I, I guess where, to me personally, where Jeremy fell flat, Lady Lejean shone. The auditors inventing a human Sona is just really interesting. We last saw them in Hogfather, where they hired the Assassin's Guild to kill Santa. And at first, this looks like the same deal. Which would make one wonder why they felt the need to make the disguise. The hiring part of that plan worked fine. Mm -hmm. So crafting this identity seems incongruous. Later we learn that there's a character motivation. They are curious about what it's like to be alive. And this is mostly just an excuse to experience it. That actually, uh, I, I have a question for you two, actually. Did you ever get to a, a point while you were reading where you actually kind of imagined what it would be like to describe to the auditors what it's like? Or, like, when they get something so basic wrong, like, what it would be like to try to explain that to them? Not in so many words, but I definitely see where you're coming from. Yeah, especially because this is later on the on in the book but there's a moment where there's a couple auditors who are measuring slabs of stone in the streets of Ankh Morkpork to find the average size you know having to think about like how insurmountable a task that is really and how futile it ultimately is because you're not going to get exactly perfectly sized pieces of stone to put in there that's just not going to happen it's like trying to take inventory after the holiday rush and get it and get your weights perfect to the ounce. I'm also almost inclined to say that Lady Myriad, whose name I keep, I should really just refer to her as Lady Lejean, because every time I say Lady Myriad, the bloodborne brain worms make me want to call her Lady Maria. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, two words that are dangerously close together. Uh, Lady Lejean, she's almost an ancient Smith type character. Which means we have another Discworld character who could be successfully played by Hugo Weaving in drag. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it! <laughs> Here we go again! <laughs> Earlier, we mentioned that Death had two things he needed to do. And now we see him working on the second one. He's getting the band back together. Woo! The other Horsemen of the Apocalypse none of whom seem particularly enthusiastic about the prospect of riding out. Death realizes he may have to face the end of the world alone. I think it's very funny to kind of personify the Four Horsemen as people who were in a band like 30 years ago and now they're kind of middle-aged adults and they're just like, ah, I don't know. Especially with how like the styling a lot of bands from like the 70s and 80s had where it was like, all about like death and hardcore and stuff but it was all really performative the idea of like that being the reality in disc world but it's very silly <laughs> uh, back with lutzi and lobsang they make their way towards ankh morpork at incredible speed thanks to the skill of time slicing which is a way of manipulating how quickly they experience the universe Along the way, Lutzi stops to rescue a yeti from a gang of hunters, teaching them the value of rule one 
and showing Labasang the Yeti's ability to save and load their personal timeline like they're in a video game. The Undertale fan in me shuddered at that reference. In in my personal notes, literally just says, Computers, man. Computer yetis. Not unlike the yeti from, what was it, the skiing game. Ski free. Mm-hmm. Susan pays a visit to Nanny Og, and eventually persuades her to explain the, to- the story of Time's son. We, the reader, don't get the full explanation just yet. Speaking of Nanny Og... Are we taking any bets on which witch uh, Lucy and Lobsang took the brooms from? It, it couldn't have been Granny because she definitely would have stopped them in their tracks. It might have been Agnes. Yeah, she seems like if, if a broom is going to get stolen under a witch's nose without them knowing, she seems like a likely fit at this point. And I think it's especially interesting to get to see Nanny Og in... Such a wildly different book, because we're really getting to see her from the outside. I don't know, something about her feels more powerful and magical, I guess, because she feels a little more untouchable in this. Yeah, and, and we also get to see a bit more of that force of personality that she is, where she just fits right in. There's no doubting that Nanny Og belongs in this book, and she had a part to play, and she played it. Returning to Ankh Morpork, Lady Lejean is increasingly captivated by the experience of life, and her fellow auditors have grown suspicious. They resolve to take human forms of their own and accompany her to the completion of the glass clock. As Lobsang and Lutzi approach Ankh-Morpork, Lady Lejean and the other human auditors arrive at Jeremy's shop, where he and Igor explain that they just need a proper lightning strike to get it started. One of the auditors, who Lejean hastily Names Mr. White uses auditor powers to instigate a thunderstorm. Lucy and Lobsang search the city for the clock, slicing time as thinly as they can, and Lobsang can almost sense where it is, but he hesitates when Lucy falls behind and is too late. The glass clock starts and the universe stops. There is nothing quite as tension building as literally racing lightning. <laughs> Lobsang regains consciousness shortly thereafter and soon meets Susan, who is thoroughly unimpressed by his attempted heroics. Together they inspect the glass clock and determine that attempting to physically interfere with it would be like trying to travel through a black hole so they'll need another way to disable the device. The two of them head out into the frozen city, where hundreds of auditors have started incarnating, giving in to their curiosity about existence. Utterly unprepared for being human, they start fighting among themselves, and Mr. White quickly gets a grip on two things, the crude fundamentals of authority and a large axe. Elsewhere in the city, Lucy has been rescued by Ronnie Soak, the milkman, who reveals himself to actually be the fifth horseman of the apocalypse, the one who left before they got famous. He's a little sour at the other horsemen for basically pushing him out of the group, and he has given up on his true identity, which Lucy eventually realizes is chaos. Oh god, somebody call that hedgehog. <laughs> <laughs> Lutzi chuckled. You mean the Chaos Emeralds? <laughs> Susan and Lobsang eventually make their way to the Ankh-Morpork Royal Art Museum, where several auditors are trying to understand what makes something art by dismantling paintings and sculptures at the molecular level. Several of the auditors try to attack the two of them, and as they run away, Susan spots several strange signs, such as an arrow that points right but says keep left. She realizes that these are traps meant to confuse and divert the auditors, who have difficulty disobeying instructions. My favorite sign has to be the one that just says, duck. <laughs> <laughs> Another auditor tries to attack Susan and Lobsang, but it is stopped by Lady Lejean, who force-feeds it chocolate and the sensation of taste is so overwhelming that it dies. Just the way you said that, so overwhelming that it dies. That was beautiful. Thank you. 
<laughs> Lejean brings Susan and Lovesang to a back room of the museum, where she has brought a Jeremy, who was rendered comatose when the glass clock started. Here, Susan explains what she learned from Nanny Og. Lobsang and Jeremy are both Time's son, and despite how Google Docs is highlighting it, that's not a grammatical error. <laughs> While she was giving birth, Time sort of stuttered and had the same baby twice. Probably the worst way you can get it wrong, to be honest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Nanny Og brought the two newborns to be raised by the guilds so that they could grow up human. I have so many thoughts about this and what it means for how Lobsang and Jeremy are the same. So many thoughts. So, actually, you were talking earlier about ADHD, and I think that the two of them kind of embody like, two different aspects of focus. They're like the two modes we have. It's just like on and off. Mm -hmm. Jeremy is hyper-focused on clockmaking, where Lobsang just can't seem to apply himself to anything. Lobsang and Jeremy, as both foundlings, I suppose, in, in this instant, Nanny Og left one of them with the Guild of Clockmakers, so Jeremy grew up in his element, which I suppose could contribute to why he seems so flat, is because he's already where he wants to be. Whereas Lobsang, while he made quite a good thief, it just wasn't quite enough, and then the monks took him in, and now he's sort of getting it, but is too good. <laughs> when Lobsang and Jeremy touch, they both vanish to be replaced with blue lights that drift around Susan and Lady Lejean. Together, they all escape the museum. They need to get back to the clock, but there are several hundred auditors in the way, so Susan leads them to the premier chocolatiers of Ankh-Morpork, so that they can load up on ammunition. Fun fact, I have worked at a chocolate shop that thought itself rather, uh, rather fancy. So when they came into this, they came into this, this chocolatier place, this, this chocolate shop, I was like, ah, I recognize this. And then, and, oh, yup, mm-hmm, ten pound or ten dollar difference between this and the regular stuff, yup. <laughs> There's a moment here where Susan notes that the name Miria is derived from Myriad, recognizing the, that the auditors chose that name because they reject personal identity. And she convinces Lady Lejean to change her name to Unity. They have way better romantic chemistry than Susan and Lobsang. <laughs> Yeah, there's more tension there because Susan and Lobsang just like do stuff together. Meanwhile, Susan and Unity actually have like differences that they need to reconcile. And because there's conflict there, there's, you know, potential for more, not just being in the same room together. <laughs> Essentially, like Lobsang and Jeremy, you could see them as they're, they are the same person, but if they were just set on two different paths, you know? And then on the other hand, you have Susan, who is a human, who is on the brink of becoming something more, and Unity, who isn't human, but is on the brink of becoming one. And, you know, they're like foils to each other. There's a nice, like, narrative parallel to there, which is, is a thought I have about the book in general, but is specifically applying to these characters in this situation. There's a lot more interesting things that can happen, I think. Once again, we are victim to my, my third greatest nemesis, compulsory heterosexuality. <laughs> yep, I was having a similar thing. I'm like, wow, that's, uh, that's some nice tension. Lucy talks with Chaos and eventually frustrates the horseman into making a comeback. Together, all five horsemen of the apocalypse ride out against the masses of auditors. They're preventing the rest of the millions of auditors from joining the ones who are on the ground. It's really interesting to see them all come to this consensus, and the auditors have, like, no idea what's going on. It's interesting that auditors are kind of foiled by consensus when that is their entire ethos. I guess the difference is that Rather than agreement taking the place of identity, it is the result of many personalities making this, the same decision. Because mm -hmm. that's what harmony really is. It's not one sound, it is several sounds that come together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As Susan and the increasingly corporeal Lobsang head for the glass clock, 
Unity and Lucy distract the auditors. Mr. White ends up cutting off Lucy's head, and while his attention is focused on Unity, Lucy loads his save point and feeds Mr. White a chocolate. <laughs> As Susan and Lobsang approach the clock, they are pulled into the realm of time, where they meet Lobsang's father, Wen, the eternally surprised. He and Susan chat while Lobsang has a private conversation with his mother, after which he tells Susan that he's going to be taking over the family business. Lobsang and Susan return to the Discworld, shattering history in the process. They find Lucy and Unity and, together, return to the Valley of the History Monks. With their help, Lobsang uses the procrastinators to put causality back in order, and the timeline is mostly fixed. Every time we've seen or heard of Time the Lady being spoken of, it's been in sort of a negative way where she seems upset or is trapped or something. And when Lobsang tells Susan that he's going to be taking over, that he'll be fulfilling the role of Time, he says something to the effect of she's happier now, she's free, and mentions when they're fixing history that he wishes that they could see the world the way he does and that it's so beautiful. So I kind of wonder what happened there if time just couldn't stand up to the pressure after so long or meeting when perhaps changed her in some way. But it, it feels like Lob Sang might be a better fit for that role now since he has such an appreciation for it since he didn't have it before where she's always had time she's always been time yeah i think there's an interesting idea there especially because we get to see a little bit of how susan's relationship with death and the power is a part of that differ from death's perception of that that you know we could extrapolate that for lob saying I do wish we had gotten to know Time a little bit better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At least see her. Because she seems so interesting. She's She's been built up this whole time. I don't know. I seem to have a bit of a fixation on the character just from some of my personal narratives. I love anthropomorphic personifications of various intangible concepts. Wow, that was a mouthful. What I would have liked is if Time was portrayed as sort of like a stop-motion animator. Because mm -hmm. it's mentioned that she like, destroys and recreates the universe every moment, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Snippets and, and fractions put together to make a movement. And I think especially because, you know, ultimately she's kind of at the core of this entire book, and we don't really get to see her. I, I think it'd be really interesting if we had, like, just a scene or whatever of the meet-cute with, like, her and Wen, because obviously there's something momentous there. We just don't really get to know her. She's like... What is it called in storytelling where you have a thing that's just a um, MacGuffin? She kind of feels like a MacGuffin. I guess that just leaves more room to speculate about who she is and what her relationship with Wen is like. And, well, I like a happy ending, so they probably have a wonderful marriage. And, you know, they're going on vacation now, a nice long vacation, and just having a grand old experience. As Susan and Unity leave the valley... They discuss the auditor perspective on humanity, and Unity requests assistance with one last thing that she wants to do, die. So Susan gets her grandfather and Chaos to find Unity a swimming pool of chocolate in which she drowns herself. Talk about choosing your own way to go. It makes sense, but also doesn't make sense. I mean, I get that loose ends need to be wrapped up and Unity would... It'd be a force that could greatly affect other stories. But dang, man. And I think part of my discomfort on her conclusion for me partially comes from that there's so many obvious opportunities for her character that, you know, just kind of end up being solidified as not happening. And it's almost kind of weird to be like, she doesn't want to continue trying, you know, to figure out what it's like to be human, to continue experiencing the world, to see how far she can take it. She just kind of decides that, you know, she's had enough with it. On the one hand, I get it, because 
the whole reason why the auditors issue personality is because to be individual is to be finite and therefore eventually die. Their whole thing of non-personhood is about avoiding death. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so embracing mortality is, is the final culmination of her personhood. It would have been also nice if like we got to her having like had several decades of various experiences and then she died Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think that would have probably felt a little more resolute in my mind not to get too dark in here but i think this is a instance of being terry pratchett being an advocate for assisted suicide as like a thing uh, that he's kind of representing in this story that's a fair way to kind of depict that without having to get super explicit with it so i guess i can respect it on that yeah it it is kind of a shame with the auditors in my opinion that they're so objective that they only categorize living by having the capability to die they just can't understand that there's so much more to it which is why it makes it sad to me that unity having discovered that there is so much more to it is still bound by that that philosophy another way you could interpret it is that knowing that she would have to spend the rest of her life sort of walking a razor's edge of experiencing nothing to the point that it would kill her that is kind of an also a horrible existence she would have to live relentless moderation yeah so instead she is wholeheartedly embracing that singular human experience that's fair i think this is kind of one of those things where it's like there's not a right version of this it's got strengths and weaknesses no matter which way you go down it it's like if we could all rewrite this book i i don't think we would necessarily find the right conclusion with that so lob sang and lucy have a sparring match where lucy reveals he's actually an exceptional fighter and declares that lob sang has completed his apprenticeship as a parting gift to his master Lobsang injects new thyme into the valley, ripening the cherries on the trees. Susan, for her part, returns to her classroom, where Lobsang appears to her, and they share a perfect moment. It's implied that they kiss. Yeah. <laughs> so that was Thief of Time. What did you think? I mean, in general, I think this is a really good, excellent book. I was very entertained through the entire thing, and... One of the things that kind of stuck out to me as I wrapped it up is that I realized there are a lot of things that are set up in the first half of the book that are picked up again in the latter half. Like the cherry blossom thing. Lucy complains about how he's sick of cherry blossoms and would love to see cherries. And so there are cherries at the end. And how Susan's restraint with eating one chocolate regardless of what it is is also brought up in the last moment of the book and with the yeti heads and like there are, i remember when we talked about eric i think it was where we said that it kind of felt like an early draft this one it's very clear to see where those editing decisions have been made because I highly doubt that anybody could have like everything so organized in their mind to make all those threads follow through on their first pass of the book and I find it really masterful and it's really interesting and I think it's one of those things that if I were to go back and reread the book I'd find even more that I missed the first time around. I greatly enjoyed this one. I I almost ran out of time to finish it because of things going on. I'm I'm back in school now and it's it's wonderful. I'm gonna be a computer druid but uh dang (laughs) <laughs> and like to your point, Liz, there are a couple things that aren't quite as neat as they could have been. Mm-hmm. Throughout the most of the first half of the book, there's flashbacks to when founding the monastery, and his apprentice Claude Poole seems frustrated with uh, his master's just sort of nonsense. It's implied that he just sort of leaves, which doesn't really come back at all and he's just sort of wondering like how did the monastery actually get formed and everything yeah and that's something that 
I also think there are a couple like weaker points in this book. That's definitely one of them. And I think uh, Jeremy's personality is another one. But I think in general, those weaknesses don't necessarily like ruin the book overall. One more Igor for like how much attention is paid to him in like like a good third of the book. He just sort of stops being in it. Mm -hmm. Which I guess is preferable to what might have happened in a different draft, which is like that maybe Igor actually just like was killed by the glass clock. So you don't want that either. Not poor sweet Igor. About Jeremy and Lobsang, we mentioned the thing about them as like two different expressions of ADHD. They have a lot going on thematically and story structure wise that almost feels hidden from the reader at first glance. Uh, here's my take. He, both of them doesn't entirely respect other people because he knows that he has some skill or knowledge beyond their understanding, yet he's emotionally frustrated because he senses something incomplete within himself. Once the two versions of him are united, then he's mostly at peace and learns to properly respect other people. But that's the theory. In the actual text, the narration doesn't give either version of him enough focus to actually solidify that arc. The Jeremy scenes are take a backseat to Igor, while Lobsang is almost entirely focused on Lutzi. What Jeremy has that Lobsang lacks is a sense of purpose. He has a thing that he knows he's good at and enjoys doing. What Lobsang has that Jeremy lacks is more like a generality, it's less of a specialist. It, it's so satisfying just having two characters once you realize they're meant to come together in whatever form whether that be like work partners romantic partners or literal soulmates i suppose yeah it it's it's so satisfying to to have that happen and realize what was putting you off about one character is what's present in the other and vice versa and now they make a whole neurodivergent and one that can control time. I remember I saw a post on, on some social media about ADHD people with the power to control time would be unstoppable or just procrastinate forever. And we spend a lot of time with Susan, but Susan has less of a character arc in this book than Jeremy or Lobsing could have. Although I do think that she, her character has grown more than it has in her previous books. Yeah, I think that's fair. For example, in the book where she's introduced, it's actually mentioned that she doesn't like chocolate or, like, rejects it. And now she definitely seems to have inherited her mother's sweet tooth. <laughs> her main thing is this subtly hinted at conflict between how she values what she considers to be sensible and her reluctance slash eagerness to embrace human desires, most prominently with the chocolate, but also her own sexuality. We saw how she's clearly embarrassed by her fascination with some of the risque sculptures of the art gallery. I wanted to ask, are the chocolate jokes too much? Because a uh, different podcast I was listening to compared them to like the newspaper comic strip Kathy. It's been a long time since I've read it. <laughs> I think I've seen it a couple times. The narrative definitely conflates chocolate with, like, femininity to a certain extent. Although, like, male characters aren't uh, entirely rejecting of it. Like, that's how they defeat Mr. White. And uh, when Lucy is able to resist eating more than one chocolate-covered coffee bean, it could be easily attributed to his being a monk and everything. We could also kind of interpret, you know, chocolate as a, as a motif in this book as... An expression of, like, humanity and, like, finding joy in things and, and indulging in those joys. And I think, you know, you could, like, draw some threads there where it's feminized, but I don't necessarily think it is explicitly. I think we just happen to have female characters talking about it because they're the only ones who are really there at that point in the book. A major motif of the book and the series is that humanity is sort of infectious. And that human form leads to human thoughts. This is referenced with the Four Horsemen, but more central to the Auditors, and especially Lady Lejean, now, aka Unity. Now, I'm inclined to wonder why the focus of that seems to be on humans rather than dwarfs or trolls, or any of the other intelligent races of the Discworld. The Doyleist explanation is that Terry Pratchett was writing for a human audience who tend to get more easily invested in stories about humans. But exploring the possible in-universe reasoning, it probably comes down to the fact that humans are the most likely 
to interpret the world in a way that facilitates change. Trolls tend to be more passive, while dwarfs have a cultural emphasis on tradition. So it tends to be humans that are more, most likely to get excited about the prospect of things changing. Yeah, also in most fantasy, humans tend to be the most versatile, partially because we, as creators, writers, humans, we know ourselves, and we know there's just so much diversity amongst ourselves that it's very difficult to come up with another creation that is equally as diverse without assigning them various human qualities and focusing really hard on one of those to separate them from the others. I think in general you can make the case that you could make the same kind of point with a non-human character if we had had non-human characters as the point of view characters earlier on in the story because there are aren't really a whole lot of those, you know, where we get to see the story happening through their perspective. And it gets a little vague because this is a book written in third person, not first person. But we would have been primed, I think, at this point to understand that functionally on the inside, their thoughts and hearts and feelings and all that are just the same as humans. Um, it's just that physically they are not. But I think that would have needed to happen, like, a while ago. <laughs> I also wanted to draw attention to the mention of floral clocks, which Lobsang says to Lucy is how time wants to be measured. I think that helps explain why time falls in love with a human rather than a dwarf or a troll. Uh, humans are the ones who care most about plants, and with them, the sunlight, the seasons, and the understanding of time as a process. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. On a different note, to give a very personal gripe, I wish we got to see more of the Thieves Guild. I think it's interesting because it gets mentioned almost as often as the Assassin's Guild, but we never actually see inside this one the way we do for that one. Mm -hmm. I mainly bring it up because I think that the Thieves Guild would be a great central element for a Discworld tabletop role-playing game. <laughs> yes. Maybe I'll design that game. I think it does the one thing that uh, a lot of RPs really struggle with, which is giving your characters built-in motivation to go somewhere and do things. Exactly! That is always the hardest part. Speaking of the Assassin's Guild, there's one or two very small references to pyramids, uh, mainly referring to how it and small gods share a few minor characters as an instance of a uh, scar on history. And you'd think that an entire country trapping itself in a time bubble would be a bigger deal for the history monks. But maybe it was and we just didn't notice. I think at that point we're starting to get like maybe a couple steps removed from this book. So I can see maybe why we didn't spend a whole lot of time on that. So for me, the message of this story is that we must embrace change both in the world around us and in ourselves. It's woven throughout the main story. The auditors want to create total stillness and are undone by their transformation into human shapes. The five horsemen are nearly defeated because they refuse to acknowledge how they have changed over their time in human form and are only victorious when they welcome chaos back into their fold. And the history monks, as an organization, want to embrace tranquility and so find Lu Tsi frustratingly unpredictable. But in the end, Lobsang seems to be getting them to accept the flow of the universe as represented by ripening the cherries on their trees. The universe being stuffed does not seem to be actively malicious the way that we've seen some other cosmic forces wreak havoc. Because the story isn't really about maligning stagnation, it's about celebrating the ability to grow. I think that sums it up. Also, one more point, that this is the end of the Death series. Oh my gosh. We're hitting so many ends. I'm, I'm still just... <sighs> I really liked this book. A good high note for the Death series to go out on, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we're almost at the end of this episode, so I'd like to thank both of you for joining me. Also thanks to Willow Carter for our theme music, and to all of our listeners. If you'd like to join in the discussion, there are links in the show notes to our Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, and our Discord server. And if you would like to support the show directly, consider contributing to our Patreon. Patreon.com slash Weird Sisters Podcast, where for as little as a dollar a month, 
You get access to the show notes, previews of each episode, and other cool bonuses. Not only that, but we shout out one lucky patron each episode, and this one is dedicated to Robin, who continues to be our small god. Thanks, Robin. Thank you. And of course, we'd like to end each episode with the result of our audience poll for the favorite footnote. A chocolate you did not want to eat does not count as chocolate. This discovery is from the same branch of culinary physics that determined that food eaten while walking contains no calories. <laughs> Next time we'll be looking at The Last Hero, which will probably be a much shorter episode. Until then, the turtle, the turtle moves. moves. <laughs>